Good evening, good to see you again, and sorry for not being able to be physically there. I'm going to give you some updates about how the universe of collection data is developing. We know that collection data are important for biodiversity, ecology, environmental science, as they are repositories of the history of the planet, and we know that that week has been crucial in ensuring that this data can be shared sensibly by providing standards and sort of manuals that enable data to interoperate and talk to each other and fit together in the same files, so to speak. Well, this is the data that we have now available for public use for uh, about collection uh, collection uh, specimens, which uh, according to GBIF is roughly 250 million primary data records, which is a big quantity, but it's not that bigger than it was several years ago. GBIF has grown, but mostly by occurrences. What happened with this universe of collection data? What I did? Well, apparently, we must continue trying to get this data into the open. About 10 years ago, a little more than that, only 13, uh, I was tasked with uh, uh, calculating how much work we had in front of us in order to get all this information uh, in the open. Uh, I wrote a paper and 13 years later, another paper has appeared using a completely different set of techniques, which uh, also tried to calculate this figure, how much data are locked in collections and uh, what is the task ahead? Which resources should we allocate in order to complete the task? The techniques I used were basically um, uh, statistics and distribution analysis and some other techniques uh, developed from uh, sampling theory. Um, with all that, I came to a conclusion. The most significant one was that there were something like one to two billion uh, data records locked in collections. Well, the Johnson and Owens paper looked at the data of only 70 institutions, the large ones, collecting most of the data that are available in war by using interviews and going uh, institution by institution, collating the data, and they came to a similar conclusion. They saw that according to their extrapolations, there were something like 1.6 to 2.2 billion data records, which is a remarkably similar figure. Well, so in summary, 10 years ago, we knew about something like 4,000 collections. We could estimate that there were something like 6, to 8,000. And now in 2023, we know because there is a registry of collections that is not complete, but it's working and finally, finally advanced, that has, that has almost 8,000 collections. In terms of specimens, at that time, there was something like 600 million specimens of which we knew. Um, GBIF was recording something like 60 to 90 million at that time. A survey that GBIF did among institutions produced something like 800 million records. And a similar figure was obtained by the GBIF nodes in a survey. My estimate came to up to almost 2 uh, billion records. And uh, today, the Griscoll, the Global Repository of Scientific Collections. If you, if we, if we sum all the data there, we go to 600 million. But if we look at the institutions and look at the small print, in which they say we have this many animals and this many plants, etc., we come to about 1.2 billion. GBIF keeps track of about 200. Uh, a little bit of 210 million if we take out duplicates that might be in two separate collections. And Johnson Owens calculated 1.1 uh, billion 
known collections. Okay, how we got there? We got there because big and large collections started soon in the early in the, in the 19th century and then started to go uh, grow and grow by steps. But this growth has been large over the last uh, few decades, over the last few years. Especially in the in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, many collections have spread uh, where previously no collections or very few collections existed. If we take the size of those collections and we calculate their distribution using a log scale, the log scale I'm using is an octave that's power of two, so each class has twice the number of elements of the previous class. We get a figure which is basically a normal. A normal, which is obviously a log normal. In this uh, plot, the yellow bars are data that can be located in the global registry of collections, and GBIF might add additional data, not yet in the register, but still being submitted as datasets that amount for this tiny, uh, uh, this small uh, additions here. Whereas the Johnson Owens uh, part is right here at the right on green, because they only look at the largest collections. Okay, but if we look at the number of specimens that this represents, obviously the largest collections, even though they are less, they contribute much more. That's something expected, naturally. So what we want to see is whether behind this accumulation exists more data. Actually, GBIF has a lot of data uh, hiding behind this accumulation because those are already recorded in, in the global registry. So, but some of them were not, and they are appearing here. In fact, many collections have not been digitized. Some of them have been, but many have, have not been. If we look at the distribution of how by big these collections that have been digitized are, it turns out that most collections of middle size, well, they have a very low level of digitization or at least of sharing those small collections down here. And the countries holding those are quite varied. There are many countries holding medium-sized collections. This is because digitization takes resources, of course, and in some places you might have more or less resources, and digitization will basically be dependent on the resources available. The old collections have been working a lot for a long time. In terms of absolute numbers, they have a lot of, digit a lot of things digitized, but in terms of relative numbers, the digitization level tend to be still quite low. However, the smaller collections tend to be a higher level of digitization. It's, it's easier to have more data out if your collection is small. So large collections, some of them have a lot of data. Some of them are well digitized. They have devoted a lot of resources. Many of them are still in a small level in, in relative terms, but the medium-sized collections are not many, not very well digitized, and they are many too. Let's go back to this plot that we saw before and look at it carefully. You can notice something odd here, which is quite obvious when you look at any distribution. The oddity here might point out of what to where this where those missing data are hiding. They are hiding here, basically. You see, the medium sized collections from 2,000 2, specimens to 4,000 specimens, particularly this size, seems to be missing. There seems to be a gap. It might represent the threshold by below which digitization occurs at fast pace and about which you start thinking, well, mm, I might digitize if I can, or let's start slowly, or let's look for resources. I don't think this is coincidence. This seems to be a, a threshold that marks the probability of digitization. 
Let's order collections by size. This is something I did uh, several years ago. Let's do it now, again, with what we know now. And also, let's have a look at how, how many data are digitized in GBIF. We see that the declared size of collections, which is the white line, follows a peculiar curve, which is rather similar to the curve that we had 13 years ago. So we can use the, sa you can use the same approach and try to extrapolate where this central part, the interquartile range, would take us if we simply prolonged that. And we would go to something like 8,000, actually it has uh, 8,500 collections approximately, existing that we don't yet know. That's about twice as many as we know from GBIF. If we apply that to the complete global registry, the amount of the figure will obviously, obviously be larger. This means that these small collections need to be digitized, and not, not because they are small and easy to do, but because they might be important. In fact, if you, if you look at how they are used, those small collections are heavily used. For instance, if we look at the citations in terms of, say, of the number of citations that those collections receive in terms of, of size, we see that very rapidly citations for smaller collections increase quite rapidly if we look at them in relative terms. So if we plot collection size against citations in relative terms, citations per year per specimen, we see that there is an obvious obvious bias towards the smaller collections. Smaller collections get more bang for the buck, let's say. It, the specimens get more cited than the large collection. They are less diluted, let's, let's say. Obviously, the older collections get uh, are largest in size, but the younger collections might be smaller because they are younger too, but still, still, they are cited quite often. So the hypothesis seems to hold, and if we then apply all the techniques to the current data and we try to estimate how where we are now or where we should be now, we can calculate that the number of collections uh, should be up by something between 15 and 50%. I estimate the number of collections existing out there in 11,000, 11, and the number of specimens could go up by 1.5 to 24 percent. It's less because the largest collections are already covered up by, by very accurate data. So that's up to 2.4 billion records of data, which is the size of the task that we have in front of us. So surface data and neighbor methods seem to confirm the old estimates. The queue of medium-sized collections of waste digitization or sharing and smaller collections might get digitized or shared sooner. Sharing, however, is still something we need to do faster and to a larger extent. Thank you.